Danilo, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, as I like to start these all now, I'm at Cambria Global Headquarters of the Pandemic, which is my bedroom. Uh, but we got a nice veneer of Gotham City in the background today. Where, uh, where, is, where are we talking to you from? Yeah, so I'm in, in the Bergen County in New Jersey. It's uh, one of those counties uh, commutable to New York City. So 35 minutes, you are in Manhattan. Uh, so we were in the epicenter of the whole crisis or the, of the whole pandemic. Well, glad to hear uh, you are safe and uh, okay, as though you mentioned you have some teenagers, so um, not without its own challenges. Uh, I'm uh, somewhat the opposite end. I got a three-year-old who may make an appearance at some point during this podcast. Yeah. We'll see. Um, all right, so this is going to be a fun one today. We're going to talk about all things investing. We're going to talk about stocks, uh, but let's get a little origin story. You're a fellow, a fellow nerd, fellow engineer. Is that right? Yeah, I'm an electrical engineer. I never worked well, as, as such. That's a hard. Uh, that's the hard one. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's what I usually say. All the, you know, all the numbers are there. Uh, the, I, but I, I worked very briefly as an engineer, actually, as a methods and process engineer, uh, on a headlights and head headlamps factory. Uh, it was very interesting, though, as to start my career to see real operations. I still bring that to with me today when I'm looking at a business for investing. It makes a difference. Sometimes I can, you know, I can remember the times that I was down at a production line and, you know, and make a relation to the numbers that I'm seeing that at the, at the end of the day needs to be translated to a real business. Yeah. Um, I remember my old man who was an electrical engineer used to always say that. He said, Bev, it's a great analytical foundation. And I would tell myself that I was just miserable uh, at the bottom of the library where my friends were out playing poker or watching football or drinking beers. Um, yeah. All right. So you started out engineering, made your way to finance. What was the path there? Yeah. So the so I started with my engineering course. Uh, it was at University of Sao Paulo, one of those universities that you have to study like crazy to get in and much more to get out right so so first job was as an engineer methods and methods and process engineer helping with production uh and then you know i although i enjoy that work that day today i i i wanted to do something different and the first thing that i that i managed to do was i went to city city bank in their trainee program uh, back in the 90s, um, that was my first interaction with finance, but it was very banking oriented. Uh, from there, I was doing also a pre-MBA course, if you will, uh, also in Sao Paulo. Uh, and then I moved to an investment bank, like a local aggressive investment bank. Terrible feet, stayed there for like six months, and then I went to McKinsey. Uh, but it's still Sao Paulo working as a consultant. The, the true transition when I started to to build the knowledge that I still use today was when I went to do my MBA at Columbia Business School. Now, the House of Value Investing, I had contact uh, with great teachers there. You know, one you probably know, Bruce Greenwald, that was the one taking the, the course to a, to a different level there. Um, so, so that was my first contact with finance. Then when I came, uh, I went back to McKinsey, I, I, went, uh, I went to the corporate finance practice, which is still consulting, but now you're talking much more focused on valuations, right? Which means, you know, if a company were, was going to do an m and uh, sometimes the CFO would like to have uh, an opinion before talking to bankers, before talking to, you know, the target company, if you will. Uh, so we would come before before the negotiations started uh, to give them an idea of of value and process, etc. Uh, that was a great learning because I would parachute in projects that I knew nobody there, not no the client or even the consultants. I was all over the country in many different industries, and we have a few weeks to come with some useful answer for for the CFO. Fantastic, right? That that's where I learned to be able to get a lot of information, quickly put this on a spreadsheet and get to some conclusions. After that, uh, that's when I made my move to the you know uh, world of, of investing. So I went to a big hedge fund, $2 billion plus, uh, and I went there to uh, make their valuation process better. 
uh, they were doing valuations, discounted cash flows, but you know there was room for improvement. Uh, I stayed there for a while. It was a very, uh, very busy time in that industry. It was just pre-08-09 crisis, right? Mm -hmm. that, so that crisis was very uh, messy in the industry. And eventually I had the, uh, maybe a good idea to launch a hedge fund with a friend. Uh, he was in Brazil. And I was in New York. So doing what we are doing now, I have been doing this since 08, right? Mm -hmm. So we, quite frankly, the technology was already uh, good enough to do video calls and share screens back like in 08. Uh, so we had a, a few analysts and then that's where we build more knowledge on a lot of companies and that's what I still bring with me today. So some of the valuations that I deal with today, I started working on them in 05, 06. Right, I'm on version 47 of some yeah. of those models, right? Um, so, so then after having a hedge fund for a few years, um, eventually the seeders and partners that we had, they asked for the money, we decided to close down the fund. My first reaction was to try to do a hedge fund again. I started talking to some family offices because it's the core. Family offices are usually the ones that understand the deep fundamental analysis that I that I try to do, uh, because many times they have businesses themselves, and so when I show them uh, detailed valuation with a lot of fundamentals on a trucking company, sometimes hell, oh, that's exactly what we do, or we had a business in 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 that that same that same industry, so we understand what you're doing. So it's good for me when. The person, you know, my potential client, uh, whoever is talking to me, knows a particular business because they understand then my focus on fundamentals. Um, so the so then because the market was already in a seven, eight years, nine years bull run, every single person, every single family office that I was talking to uh, was ex feeling extremely comfortable. It's like, well, you know what? Why do I need to do all this? Great what you do, but I will just buy, I will buy some index and I will be fine. Mm -hmm. It happens right like this. We know that, right? I mean, when markets are running for too long, people get complacent. And that's when they, they, they take their, their, their eye out of the ball in terms of looking at the business that you're buying uh, or shorting for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, so the... You know, I was not successful in, in raising any significant amount of money. And then I started to, to, uh, to think about an idea that we had, even when running a hedge fund, which was, you know, can I run the same strategy, the same hedge fund long short strategy on a, a managed account? Is this possible? Because back in 08, 09, 07, because of trading costs, you couldn't. Right. If you have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars in a in a in a managed account, and you have minimum uh, trading tickets of fifty dollars, that's it. You can't not build a true portfolio with risk controls, uh, position sizes that are as as granular as you want them, uh, because the again the, the the trading costs would would eat your your performance. Now fast forward ten years. Uh, what started to happen were companies like interactive brokers uh, made that type of investment possible. Uh, so, you know, I started to uh, experiment with some of those brokers and eventually settled on interactive brokers and then did another thing that I was, I had on my back burner that I always wanted to do. I've been programming computers since I was 12, right? I mean, I started with a Sinclair computer, 16K of memory. Right. I don't even know. I don't even know the Sinclair. Sinclair pre Commodore. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, Commodore was like a dream computer. That was black and white, 16K, 16,000 characters of memory, uh, using a tape recorder, and we would do like you know me and some friends who do presentations at school using that computer. You know, teachers like, what is, I mean, what is that? What, what, what is that thing that you're bringing here with a map of the uh, Soviet Union at that time, right? Presenting, uh, showing where they had a uh, coal mine in, in, in whatever commodity they have there and some of the, their rail uh, uh, lines there blinking on that black and white screen and it was fantastic. It was like, you know, a lot of technology back then. Uh, over the years, then I, you know, I moved to different languages. Pascal 
don't know if you ever uh, programmed on that one, C++, right? Um, and eventually what I'm, what I'm using now is Python, um, which again, it was fantastic to have the time to redevelop what I was doing. So before in a hedge fund, I would build my portfolio with a lot of rules. Right, so you know my long positions are five percent positions, my short are three percent positions, and I will simulate an ideal portfolio with the names that I have uh, today. My fair values go back as many years as, as I want, like five years, ten years, and I arrive today at an ideal portfolio, and I replicate that to my clients' accounts. Now, with a hedge fund, I could do this using uh, an Excel spreadsheet and some VBA coding. Now. Again, try to do this now with you know multiple accounts. It starts to get more complicated. So I had you know I took my time and redeveloped all this. It's the same tool that I was using on a hedge fund with Python. Now the beauty is you know it's fantastic, right? I mean you can uh, it downloads my clients' positions to that 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 code that I wrote. Uh, it uses all my fundamental uh, value, uh, fair values and build that portfolio. Um, which is even more fantastic is doesn't matter how many accounts I have, it literally takes a few seconds to run uh, the portfolio and build the trading instructions. Now, the important point is that I, I don't want to give the impression that I'm a quant guy, although yeah. if left... It's not by, an insult. It's not an no, insult. Come on. Yeah, I, it's a no, compliment no. for me. <laughs> yeah, because you know, if I were to... Uh, I, I really like to code so much that it's it's a tendency that I have to say, you know, maybe I can do this on a, a fully automated manner. Um, however, the the key for the success of the three portfolios that I can build now to my clients, not only the long short that I used to build in a hedge fund, but I can I can run a long only and a long aggressive portfolio. Quite frankly, I can run any design that I want because it gets automated, it gets executed and perfectly balanced on a weekly basis, on a bi-weekly basis, depends on how much volatility there is in the market. Uh, I, I could also do some studies that I couldn't do before. For instance, if I let my positions deviate uh, by around 15% of their target price, I capture some momentum. Mm. So my performance goes up. Right. So again, with a with a tool like this, I could say, OK, what happens when I run simulations and I I match my ideal portfolio every single day? What if I let it it goes off by one percent before I trigger the adjustment by two percent, by three percent until, you know, I got to the 15 percent number doing some studies and and fine tuning to a, a compromise between not being on top of my ideal portfolio but also not not missing the momentum. So it's yeah. fantastic, right? You can do all this, you know, you do a lot of that stuff too. You you, you know the, the the how important some of those drivers are, right? So, so uh, it'd be a good side business. You got a software company now too. <laughs> exactly, right? If I cannot succeed as an investment yeah. manager, I will sell yeah. some of that software. Um, the, so, but then there is one important thing. The key for success in my approach are the fair values that I have for 60 plus companies. And that's where I spend 80% uh, of my time, right? So it's literally, right. yeah. Let's so talk I, about that. So, so rational uh, get started, what, what timeline? What, what year is this? That was early 08. Uh, oh, timing, wow. terrible timing, right? Oh, yes. Uh, so we started. Well, it depends. You look at it two different ways. You survived, so um, you made it. Um, yeah. So give, give me your framework. You, you've alluded to it. I know audience hasn't heard it yet, but give me give me the broad framework of your approach, what you're looking for, and we'll kind of drill down into some specifics as we go. Sure. So I everything starts with fundamental basic analysis of businesses that are prone to be modeled. I, what I mean by that is, you know, I cannot model a new internet company, a new technology company, a new biotech company, right? There is, I, my approach will work on, on businesses that have some level of saturation and have a lot of fundamentals that I can put my hands around. You know, take a trucking company. 
right? A trucking company, they will tell you how many trucks they have, how many miles they run, what is the, the how much they charge for ton mile, uh, and they are going to have some disclosure on their costs, and you can play with that. And the reason for that, the key for fundamental analysis and why it works as an investment tool is because if you plot the earnings estimates of those type of companies over the share price, it's almost a perfect correlation. What I mean is the market will tend to overpay when earnings are good and underpay when the company gets in some kind of trouble. It could be an economic uh, uh, crisis. A virus is a very particular type of crisis for most of those companies, of course, uh, but usually you have some sort of cycle. Even in the most stable companies, you're gonna find some sort of cycles, which will cause some level of fluctuation in earnings. And this has a huge bias on the market price. Right, so you plot, I sent you some, some material and probably saw that uh, the, the, the correlation is, is just like almost perfect. Um, so here is the opportunity, which is, can I, at, by looking into some companies in a very repetitive manner, in a very uh, process-oriented ma oriented manner, can I look into those companies and have a better chance than random in forecasting their earnings? Again, I'm not talking about precisely forecasting earnings for the next quarter. I can't do that. Although, I mean, if I could, it would be fantastic for returns, but I can't. Um, what I can do is recognizing where we are in the industry cycle, in the economic cycle, where those earnings are in terms of historical strength, meaning are those abnormally high earnings, are those among the most uh, benign earnings levels that we're going to find for this company? If the answer is yes, do not model that forever. Model a reversion to the mean. Simulate a recession in front of you, right? And the opposite is true when you are in a situation right now. The earnings that you're going to see over the next year or so are going to be horrible. Now, the, 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 the challenge is, can you simulate those earnings leaving that recession? Uh, and for a company with you, that you have uh, 20 years of historicals, which is what I have usually have for my, my models, I go back 20 years for those companies, right? Which, quite frankly, as you get older, it's not that far away. Because I do, remember, <laughs> I do remember those 20 years working <laughs> with some of those companies, you know, doing evaluations where now I'm losing some data already. It's very, it's almost, it's interesting because sometimes I'm updating a, a evaluation and I, I'm starting to lose, I, you know, 98, 99, which was the pre-crisis. So the first data point that I have is a bottom of a recession. And then you go to the housing boom, a very strong recession. Another good economic cycle now, a bizarre uh, uh, level of, of, of uh, earnings distress. Uh, but the point is, as you build those valuations with extreme care for those companies, you and the more you work with them, in, so in, in other words, it's extremely important to be repetitive. In, so I do not run after new ideas, right? So I keep working with a group of more or less 60 companies. Right, and I keep focusing there uh, because I learn more and more with every single crisis, every single cycle. Uh, it gives me more. And, and, and what's the what's the sort of criteria for inclusion, exclusion of those companies? Um, is it a spectrum of industries? You mentioned some you just can't model or it's tough. Uh, and also, is it just familiarity that you've been following for a long time? Is it all large cap? Like, what's the universe look like? Yeah, so it is the first, the first rule is exclude whatever you cannot model, right? You know, think about a bank, uh, think about, you know, uh, biotech or new technology companies. I love technology, but I can't model how, how much in sales and earnings a new company will have in five, 10 years. A saturated trucking company, a retailer like Home Depot and Lowe's, that's a different story. Because you know, Home Depot and Lowe's is a duopoly in the U.S., right? So your chances of understanding what's going on there is much higher, right? Um, now there is some uh, some of those names came to me when I I started working in in a hedge fund in 2005, that I keep following them, right? Because you know they were at the type of company that I could model. Sometimes I do not do a lot of new modeling anymore. Um, 
but uh, when I was building my my circle of competence, you know, that's how I called that, that group of companies, uh, there were a lot of valuations that I started. And then at a certain point, I would say, I can't really figure out how this, this company works. Or there are so un many unknowns, uh, not only knowns unknowns, but unknowns unknowns, right? It's things that you really can't put your hands around. Uh, so then I would scrap that. You know, it doesn't it doesn't matter if you if you worked many days or weeks on that on that name if you get to a point that you can not really understand part of that business you have to scrap it now so this was done over now 15 years uh, in terms of market cap you know I do not do micro caps not even small caps that's the the air the the median uh, market cap is um, around five billion dollars. So it's a mid cap company, usually companies that have single uh, line of businesses uh, that I, you know, they're, they're dominant in their business, but that segment is not that big. I do follow a company like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, um, you know, those super huge uh, companies, but they're not, quite frankly, they're not super productive for me because their earnings do not vary that much. There's much less confusion on, on, on the pricing of those names. So what percentage of the time would you say that if you look at um, your companies you follow, what percentage of the time do you think you, they fall in like the normal valuation zone where you're like, you know what, that's just not that interesting. It looks like at how it should be valued. What percentage of the time do they fall in uh, kind of the salivating, this is screaming cheap and, and vice versa, this is expensive, I, I want to get rid of it or, or even short it? Yeah, so so that the great question because the, of course, on average they are always off my fair value, um, but some companies are mostly uh, in line with what you would expect. Like a company like Coca Cola and Pepsi, uh, the market does get their earnings right and discount that around an eight percent discount rate, which. It's interesting, we can talk about this later, uh, giving low interest rates in over the last 10 years, one would expect the market to discount that cash flow maybe at a lower rate, but it doesn't. The average discount rate that kind of make my names uh, uh, be more productive in terms of producing uh, good returns is around 10%. I think it has much more to do with uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, behavior finance, you know, loss aversion, and the 10% works very well with humans. CAPM probably was very lucky when it was out and about that it was easy to use a 5% risk premium, a uh, market risk premium and 5% and um, risk free rate. And it got close to the 10%. And humans, you know, love that, right? So the, the because if I, again, with my simulations, with my portfolio build up too, if I vary the discount rate, to very low levels as if the risk-free rate was 2%, I'm always long. In other words, they always seem cheap and this is not true. I cannot really make a lot of money, even in a simulation, right? So you kind of, you can work backwards and say, no, that's not possible. The market's not scouting this, you know, at 15% nor five. So you can find that middle there. Um, but some companies, the market is, you know, cannot put its hands uh, around a proper price because there's always something going on. You know, get a company like Tempur-Pedic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the product is simple. It was, it was harder to analyze Tempur-Pedic, let's say, 10 years ago because they were gaining a lot of market share. Uh, but now they, they, they bought Sealy and they have a mix of uh, phone mattresses and regular mattresses. But there's a lot of stuff that, that uh, uh, causes some impact on their EPS from time to time. It could be just, uh, it's a consumer discretionary item. And if we are in a recession, sales will fall. Sometimes they change CEOs. I'm on the fourth CEO now, I think, uh, for the company. Right, I say that I'm actually I'm more senior use, uh, analyzing that company than literally 80, 90 percent of the CEOs on, at the company, right? Which is very interesting because you, you see them trying new things for them, but then you say, no, no, you tried this like seven years ago, and by the way, it didn't work, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
so so but you you get some of those companies or a company like Tor Industries that manufactures RVs. Now, very cyclical, right? You can, you know, I do my calculations of sales of RVs per capita and I adjust by group age, right? I'm talking about you know, people from 25 to 65 in the U U.S. or maybe 75, and you look at the at the roller lo roller coaster that sales are in that industry, and of course earnings, and the market gets super confused, right? So, mm -hmm. so it depends. So companies like with more cyclicality, you are going to find them more productive. Now. But you know, not always. Uh, it will be extremely easy for you to say, "Oh my gosh, I'm you know, I'm really into this. I want to buy." Because sometimes you have changes of habit that cause causes. For instance, give an example in the same segment as Tor. If you go back to the late '90s, and you look at Harley Davidson, mm -hmm. that was a dream company for value investors, right? They used to love it. Because, you know, and, and, and the story would go, which company do you know that people tattoo the name of the company on their arm, right? And so then Harley Davidson was this thing, you know, that everyone wanted to own because they were growing like crazy uh, and people were buying more and more uh, motorcycles. And it's so interesting because you cannot even see in motorcycle sales in the U.S. the 01 crisis, right? It's, it doesn't even show on the numbers. Now comes the housing crisis, sales collapse, right? I mean, to one third of what they were. Now, because people were buying a new house, overpaying for the house and say, well, since I'm buying this $250,000 house, what is like an 8,000 motorcycle? Come on, it's gonna be mm -hmm. a lot of fun. So that was coming together. The crisis comes, they, you know, they lose their house, they get super scared sales of motorcycles start to rebound, but then the oil crisis come in 06 and it was already declining. You know, it declines in 2017, 18, 19, and now of course it will decline even more. And we are now on a, on a sales per capita uh, in the US at a lower level than Europe, which is highly unexpected because the number was like three times higher. Sales per capita in the US versus mm -hmm. Europe. Uh, for once, uh, the U.S. has a higher GDP per capita on average, but also because the U.S. has a lot of space. So, right, in a, in a tiny, small uh, town in Italy, it's hard to have your Harley-Davidson motorcycle. In the U.S., it's, it's, it's much easier. Um, so, again, it's highly surprising. How is it possible that over 10 years, Americans are now consuming less motorcycles per capita than Europeans, and and those are that, and that's the, the the very difficult type of analysis when you are doing a fundamental analysis because sometimes those the reversion to the mean never happens, right? Mm -hmm. Now, but then it comes portfolio risk control. That's why I don't have all my 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 money in one position. So mm -hmm. I have rules to build my portfolios. So longs can be at most five percent for a reason. And I have what I call a draw, drawdown freeze, meaning if my fair value drops by 25%, not the price, the price might drop by 50, 70, since I, you know, I buy it and then it drops 50%, but I don't see anything there uh, that should justify the price drop. In other words, I don't change my valuations or if I lower my, let's suppose that I lower my valuation by five, 10%, uh, I do nothing. I just buy more, actually. I recompose the position to 5%. But if it does change because something really strange happened, you know, think about a company like Carnival Cruise Lines, mm -hmm. right? That's one, one example. Uh, the, the, the virus has been catastrophic for that industry. So my valuations for companies where I don't follow a lot of companies in the consumer service, uh, but I do follow Carnival and it was catastrophic. So then the company gets into a freeze. In other words, I do not buy more, right? So that's then, now you're talking about portfolio control. How do you go through 08, 09? And I told you that I could digress a lot. So I was telling mm. you this story yeah. of, of the timing of when I started uh, Rational, right, the hedge fund. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was in 08, 09 when a lot of those changes were happening, right? So, you know, it was exciting in the sense that uh, we helped uh, some of clients not to lose a lot of their money. 
And actually, I got my seating in March of 09. So we got at that time $25 million to start the fund um, because we, you know, we started in 08 with only uh, uh, family and friends money. Um, and by you know, early 09, we were thinking about closing down shop because like, look, this you know, super crisis, who's gonna give us money now? But the point was uh, one family office, a big a multifamily office uh, was trying to understand what was going on in the market. Right, and they said, like, who are uh, the most prepared professionals that I can find to tell me on a fundamental basis? Right, and then again, it's a multifamily office in Brazil, and then we were helping them with allocations in the U.S. So then we got our seeding, we grew the fund over those years, and eventually we made good money to our clients, but in part because we were for four or five years at our maximum net long exposure of 60%. Again, that's the des design of the, we, you know, we can talk about the portfolio rules, um, but we moved uh, to our 60% uh, net exposure uh, and stayed there for years because there were back then a lot of cheap names, mm. right? So, so then, you know, the, the, the whole fund grows from there and eventually they, you know, they, they, they decided they could do by themselves. Uh, and that's a different story. But the same thing happened with my, my clients that I have now. They were all on my long short strategy. Pre-crisis, mm -hmm. right? I exactly for the same thing. I cannot find longs. I had seven longs and I had 19 shorts. Again, nothing based on my gut feeling. It's all based on the deviation of the fair value. In other words. Yeah. And what, what does the short side look like? Is it uh, a mirror image of the long? Is it simply just based on valuation? How do you think about shorts? Because I know some people it, uh, approach it a different way. Yeah. So, you know, I it's in my case because I want to have uh, the uh, continuation on the names that I follow. I will not short companies searching for, let's say, a fraud. Because again, that would put me on the ideas treadmill. I'll have to be going after names and after ideas because eventually they would implode or not, and then that company would be gone. Yeah. So my shorts are many times companies that were my longs. It's just that the, the, sometimes the market misprices them. Mm -hmm. And again, we're talking about the type of companies that I follow, right? That mid cap with some big caps in the, in the mix, but all companies with a lot of fundamentals that I can follow. So the, the market usually prices them correctly over long periods of time, times, but then when, the, when earnings are too good because of, uh, uh, it could be, um, it could be because of an economic boom, could be an in industry boom, could be the company just uh, selling a lot of their products because they want to buy a competitor using shares. That happened with Tor, right? So they stuffed their channels because they want to buy a company in Europe and they paid part of that with shares. So the so, so it depends. So many times, again, I I'm long Tor now, but I was short like a couple of years ago, same mm. company, right? Mm. Um, would love to hear, you know, you've mentioned a few different stocks. Are there any um, particularly uh, useful representative case studies you could walk us through where you say, hey, this is a company I've been following. Uh, here's how I approached it over the last couple of years or even now, uh, you know, a framework to give us kind of a picture of how uh, you invest in a certain stock or company or anything. Uh, uh, come to mind? Yeah, no. So, you know, we, we can talk a little more about Tor, right? So since mm -hmm. I, you know, give a few, uh, a few examples, but we can have a long list of companies here and we can, <laughs> we can spend like hours talking. About Good. Well, we'll have you back on, you know, and we'll, we'll just keep right. doing case studies till the cows so, come home. Yeah, so exactly. We, we, we kill every, everybody off boredom. But the, so in the case of a company, it's, and it's not only Tor Industries, uh, I usually do valuations of a group of companies in a, a certain uh, subsector. So in the case of Tor, the companies that are in the same group are Polaris, Harley Davidson, and Brunswick. Brunswick sell boats, Polaris, the ATVs, side-by-sides, Harley Davidson, motorcycles. 
the dynamic of all those four companies is very similar. I mean, it's it's the super discretionary uh, type of item. So that's why it's it's a nice uh, case because your listeners can go and go to any website and look to uh, the their earnings over let's say twenty years, and they're going to see the see the cycles there. But it's very clear, right? Uh, what's what's going on there? So the so you get a company like Tor. It's one of the top two uh, RV manufacturing companies. Uh, uh, the other one is uh, Forest River owned by uh, by Warren Buffett. So from this from the get go, you know that the chances of this company getting into a crazy price war is hopefully very limited. So there is always the the qualitative side of the analysis mm. that you you know I'd like to start with that. I know what's the story of that company? Where do they they fit? Um, so because from that point, I start to discuss, OK, so, so how people, what is the dynamic of RV buying? You know, how, how people deal with, uh, with, with something like this? And what you're going to see is, you know, it's your classic discretionary product. No one needs to buy an RV, right? It's, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, but it is a very nice toy. Uh, the US has wonderful parks. Uh, so you have, again, this space to go and drive your RVs uh, around. Um, and it's a, it's a great way to spend your vacations. In the summer, for sure, it's going to be super popular. We know that, right? I mean, because you can't travel. And let's see how, I, I'm assuming that the price reaction that we're seeing now is the market trying to anticipate that. But again, it might be uh, short-lived. And what matters is not if they're going to sell more RVs or or not sell as as such a low number because of the recession, because now you're superimposing two two things at the same time. There is a recession. A lot of people lost their jobs, so the inclination to buy an RV is of course much lower. However, you can travel. So the the challenge in the short term. That's why I don't try to uh, to focus too much in the, in the short term. Who knows how strong those two vectors will be and who will uh, superimpose uh, which one in, in, in the next, let's say, six to eight months to nine months, a year, maybe. Um, we know that this summer will be a very unique summer. Uh, so to make any conclusions and an investment for the long term in a company based on a very abnormal uh, summer is not exactly the best way to do this, right? So you have to start to study uh, the industry first, right? So go back 10 years, 15 years, and measure sales of RVs, again, per capita, because it matters too. So everything, every consumer-led product that I, that I look into, I always have like this huge spreadsheet where uh, the US Census Bureau has, they have like a, a massive database, which is fantastic. It gives you people in the US from zero to 100 years for the next 50 years. It's fantastic, right? So, you know, I did my, my programming there, so then I can select age groups in that spreadsheet and say, look, how many people we have there and how, how much does this grow or not grow or declines? Because again, it matters for calculations like how many RVs per capita uh, will be sold in the US. And, th and those are the numbers that you're going to work with, right? So, and then, of course, you're going to see a zigzag depending on the economic cycle. This is also natural. And what you're going to see too is, of course, when companies are selling more, their margins go up. It's the natural SGNA leverage, if you will, right? It's 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 a classic. It's a it's a it's a manufacturing company. They have some fixed costs, um, which as they sell more. They have a lot of contribution to their margins. Margins make those huge, nice peaks. Earnings make those huge, nice peaks. But eventually, something happens. And I'm not even talking about you know, a huge pandemic, right? I'm talking about your regular recession. A recession comes, people, uh, consumer confidence goes down. No one will buy a 30, 40, 50,000 uh, item like an RV. Uh, those, are, those are then the super discretionary items that people finance them. It's kind of, almost like an extension to their house. Um, 
So if you look at a company like this, the correlation of price with short term earnings is just fantastic. Again, your, your listeners can go and plot those numbers too because it's easy to do. You're going to see how highly correlated those numbers are. So then what you need to do is, you know, take a step back and think about long term in terms of how much over long term cycles this, this company will, will uh, how much, how many RVs they will sell and what's going to be their market share. And that's when the margin of safety scenarios come into play. So I have my base case scenario where I'll try to do my best to do all the qualitative and quantitative um, analysis that I can to try to understand how many RVs per capita Americans will buy in the next five, 10 years, right? because I want to do a discounted dividend model because I'll model the, the debt of the company in detail too because every time that I something got me by surprise, uh, by surprise, I, I, or, uh, I, I changed my template. So what I learned is that you don't do a discounted cash flow model. You do a discounted dividend model because it forces you to model the debt side, right? Mm -hmm. So model the debt side of companies because their ratings will change, their, 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 their spreads will change over time, and you want to capture that. Um, so, the, so what I do to play with the, uh, the knowns unknowns, right? I don't know. I know that there will be a certain level of sales of, our, of RVs on average over the next 10 years, right? But I have history to guide me. But of course, I don't know exactly where this will land. So I will use those as inputs to my scenarios. So then when I use my low case scenario, which is my entry price, it's based on a lot of things not going well for the company. You know, they sell way below the historical average, RVs per capita. Margins are lower. Uh, right? Their capex are higher. So I, I punish the company up to reasonable levels, though. Right, meaning I will not make any absurdly a punitive scenario because then you can bankrupt any company and you will never buy anyone. On the great case uh, scenario is, is the, almost the opposite. What if they sell at very high levels, in perpetuity, great margins and gain market share and you know their capex is actually lower than historical levels, right? So those gives me a band a low, uh, a low, uh, low case fair value, a great case fair value, and my my base case fair value is more or less in the middle. The delta, just to give an idea, between the low case and the great case is usually a hundred percent on average. It's a lot, right? But the market sometimes I buy something, and the markets just keep going down like you know 10, 20, 30, 40 percent. The same happens on on the on the on the great case uh, side. I short something and it goes up like you know, 20, 30, 50, 100%. But if your valuation is right, eventually the market you know, will tend to, uh, uh, to see that earnings path and try to follow it. But again, it might take two, three, four years. It doesn't matter. So my, my success is measured. I measure my own success in relation to how well I was able to forecast that business, right? Okay. And then if, if I'm successful, then building a portfolio is just like an easy exercise. Well, I tell you, the RVs, certainly if conversations with friends is on uh, the forefront of a lot of people's minds, um, the uh, Sprinter conversions uh, are, are really popular with sort of the, the younger cohort because they're not as big as an RV, but uh, can be pretty mobile too. Um, but as I was telling most of my friends who are interested in, in getting one, I said, maybe rent one first for the weekend before you buy or you buy an RV. But I, I imagine the stock's got to be going bananas, right? It, it, are they, and are then they doing well? Now they, they went for, so they were even crazier before, right? I mean, the, the, the valuations were, you know, 150, 170 uh, per share, something like this. At the bottom in March, it was trading at $35. Wow. It's getting to 90 now, right? Again, it's getting you know, close to my fair value, which is insane. Because when I bought that stock, actually a couple of years ago, was when they were already in their own crisis. 
because they had stuffed channels and you know and the oil crisis also had an impact on rvs mm -hmm. um so they, they had a, a a crisis before an economic crisis arrived again i never uh, imagine that would have this a pandemic of this size. I mean, that was not why I was short before, right? I mean, and I, it's not that I hate the company either. It's just that earnings went up because they sold a lot to their to their retailers. The market just followed those earnings, and I guess like, mm -hmm. well, but for those earnings to make sense in terms of the current price, you would have to maintain those levels of sales forever with record margins forever, and of course, it didn't happen. Now. It went down to a certain level that it, it in 2018, I guess, it was at my low case scenario. I bought it, you know, it went up, went down. When it keeps zigzagging, I keep adjusting the positions and lowering my, my, my price or, or sometimes selling some parts of that, that, that stock and just having some, some realized gains. Uh, and then came the crisis. Uh, it went to $35 and now it's at 90. Now, it's impossible to justify a valuation of $35 and $90 with fundamentals in what you learned in two or three months. Makes no sense, right? So, so this crisis is very particular. Now, what happened in my case, I was able to go from seven longs to 16 longs mm. because my valuations were ready. I had... All the, I, because we were at an economic uh, peak, they all had a recession starting next year. Again, I was not forecasting any virus, anything like this. So when the virus arrived and I had to uh, uh, do a, you know, a on the fly update on my evaluations, because what I did, I now forecast a very strong recession like 08, 09. But quite frankly, for a while, I didn't know if we were going, going to go into a depression. Right? I mean, it was no, it was an unknown. I mean, how is this uh, virus a society destroying virus? Right? We didn't know. Now we know it's not. It is a very serious disease, but it's not a society destroying type of virus. Um, so the depression scenario, I think, it's out, uh, but the a severe recession is still here. So I literally I worked nonstop for, I would say, like six weeks every single day. Right, because again, to keep all those six templates updated and relevant, etc., in the middle of a crisis like this, I have to work 10, 12, 14 hours a day, and I have everything. I have a clock running literally right now, right? I mean, every time that I'm in front of my computer, I have a clock that runs backwards, uh, so I can time how much time I'm using in each one of my companies. I cannot spend too much time on them, um, in any single one. Um, but the, the point is, now, af after doing a lot of work and trying to incorporate the size of this new recession, because I was not forecasting an 08 or 09 recession anymore. I was saying, you know what? The 08 or 09 recession, that was crazy. That's not what I have to model as the next recession, because that's not, that was not normal. And here we are, right? <laughs> in a recession yeah, that so yeah. in, in magnitude, uh, on average, right? I mean, some companies is going to be catastrophic, but for, you know, think about airlines. You know, the, the size of the damage that it does to the balance sheet. Of course, people will fly again, but the, the problem is companies, if you let them without sales for too long, the balance sheet gets destroyed. Even if the company had no leverage or a reasonable amount of leverage, if you have to borrow a lot of money today to survive for one or two years without almost without revenues, well, that debt needs to be paid. So the equity holder, as it should be, is the one that loses first. Now, if you can't come back, then even the bondholder loses. And if the company goes bankrupt, chapter seven, not even 11, even the, the, the workers and management loses, right? They lose their jobs. So that's the natural process in, in the capital markets. Equity holders first, debt holders, the other stakeholders, which are the, the employees um, and management. Uh, so we should see some companies that will be, as an operation entity, okay in five years, that will wipe out their, their equity holders. Mm -hmm. It's right, I mean, depends on the timing. I think about the hotels 
airlines, cruise lines, even a company, it's not going to happen with a company like Starbucks, but Star, Starbucks valuations will be, it was impaired because they had losses or much less earnings than they would, that one would think they would have for a while. Right? Imagine someone owning their shares like one or two years ago, thinking about their cash flows, which still has some growth because of the international market. They might be very close to saturation in the US, but again, it gets impaired. Um, so the, the, so the challenge in, in, a, in a situation like this for a company like Tor is now, what if we go to a scenario where the recession is even worse than 08 or 09? How much impairment there is in the, in the cash flow of this company that will replace, that will bring more debt, which means you equity holder now have less in, in terms of your rights to claim future cash flows. And, 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 and again, it's a great opportunity, but also it's, it's, it goes to the scary level of opportunities. Some companies are so in such a gray zone that you really don't know if they will survive or not, or not right? So again, my scenarios are such that I'm modeling normal recessions ahead of you when you are in a, in a market peak or an economic peak. Um, and I have to revise that model, you know, transform them all, all those 60s in a strong recession. Some companies like Coca-Cola and Pepsi, there is no, not really any impact there, but on others, of course, there is. But even though I was able to go from 10% net short to 55% net long, very close to my level. But I'm surprised that I didn't buy uh, 30 names, 35, 40 names. At this level of distress in the market, in the economy, uh, with social unrest, it is quite surprising, I have to say, because if I do my simulations and go back to the 08 or 09 crisis, I buy almost 40 companies mm. of the 60. Right now, I have only 16. Well, and yeah, and walk me forward from March. We're recording this in early June. We've seen a um, rip roaring, romping, stomping move right back up. Uh, I think. NASDAQ may have closed at all-time highs today, and S&P is pretty darn close to flat on the year. What does the portfolio look like now? Has, uh, has uh, it reverted back to beginning of 2020? Does it look the same as in March? How, uh, how are you finding opportunities? Yeah, so now it's, it's very, it, I have to say, it's really uh, strange to see the market rebounding that fast. And again, I'm talking about the very boring companies, right? That's mm. under the radar of a lot of people. Uh, I'm not talking about FANGs or big companies that are part of the S&P. Um, I'm talking about, you know, uh, mattresses companies, trucking companies and stuff like this. Uh, right now, I have a couple of companies that are very close to leave the portfolio as longs. And I have three companies that are close to become shorts. Mm. Right? I mean, again, very unexpected because the ugly numbers are going to start to be released in July, August. Now, everyone knows that you, the, the second queue will be horrible, right? That's, that's baked in the cake. Everyone knows that. However, what people don't know is what will management say? Will they say, you know, well, and things are rebounding now or it's getting worse? So I think the market will be uh, surprised by, uh, there will be a lot of noise over the next two or three quarters because that's when we're going to see the numbers and we are going to see the CEO, CFO guidance in terms of how their business are doing in terms of uh, recovery. Um, and I think people are, in many cases, people are going to be positively surprised and in many cases it's going to be a nightmare. It's like, oh my gosh, it's not rebounding at all. Because again, we have to balance the fact that of course we are in a recession. When we have 30 million uh, unemployed people, uh, consumer power went down. It, it's a fact. Every single CEO and CFO is telling me when I read the conference calls and I send them emails, they're always telling me, it's like, yeah, we are cutting CapEx, right? I mean. It's a classic recession. That was 2000. 2000 was a market-led recession, right? So again, I was leaving my MBA uh, and going back to McKinsey, working as a, as a consultant, 
and for a while there were no projects, right? Even in mm -hmm. I was a re returning analyst. And as a returning analyst, you're a hot commodity on a consulting firm because you cost the same as a young associate, but you know what you're doing already because you have been working there for two years, right? So you know the, the ropes and you're much more productive. Even in my case, I stayed for a few weeks or, or months on the beach. What they say, it's when you have no project. You know, I was doing my modeling, using CompuStat and trying to build the genesis of the model that I use today, or the template that I use today. Um, but but that was a classic. Every single CEO, because it, they, those were scary moments. And by the way, we had also a virus going on, SARS was was going on, right? It was out. Uh, and then, of course, September 11, and it triggers a recession. The market collapsed. Uh, and classic, every single CEO stopped uh, their, their CapEx program, then the, re the, the, the recession I intensifies. Um, interesting to note though, and let's see how this recession goes, if you go back and look at the GDP numbers, the components of GDP, right, on the consumption part, in 2000, it was still growing, it was growing less, but it never became negative year over year in a quarter. So investments became negative in 2001, right? Because again, it was the CEO, CFO scare. Fast forward to 08, 09, everything became negative, right? So in other words, government, even government spending became negative in 08, 09. Uh, the, the, the printing money that you're seeing now, it's a lot of transfers, but that, that's not expenses. That's not really GDP growing in, in, in that sense. We need to see consumption and investments. Those are the ones that really move GDP. Uh, investments, it's for sure going to come down like crazy. So let's see how bad consumption will be. And again, that's going to be the second time since data is measured, since 48, that they see the consumption will go negative again. Hmm. Very, very, so it's a strong recession for sure. What uh, are there any names that you see are just massive discounts to your fair value estimates? Is there anything that uh, you can just say you're you're licking your chops about? You know the the co companies that have a certain level of leverage uh, might be in that case in that situation. So a, a couple of examples. One company uh, it's uh, uh, um, Owens Illinois. It's the OI glass. That's the, the new name that they they uh, they have now. It's a it's a glass container manufacturer company, right? So, and that's an interesting case because the business uh, is relatively stable. But if you look at the his, the history of that company, and by the way, this is a great example why I do not automate my fundamental analysis. Why, why it's so it's almost impossible and I automate the portfolio construction and trading so right when I build my portfolio is a coding Python and it writes also my trading instructions I just upload this to my broker press one button I have like one human interruption there if you will I'm not crazy I don't want my machine to kill me and start trading by itself um, so uh, I have one button there that I have to press uh, to, to, to release the trades um, but uh, if you look at OI Glass, uh, they over the next 10, 15, uh, over the, the past uh, 10, 15 years, they made a major transformation. They had a mix of plastic and glass, and they sold all the plastic plants. And now, and now they invested more on glass plants. Now, you look at the history, and that's why studying what the company has done following management is important. You look, for instance, when they bought some assets in Brazil, was at the worst time possible, right? With the currency in Brazil extremely overvalued, right? They overpaid, and then Brazil gets into a long-term recession that lasts for like three, four years. Asset prices, they would have bought that by literally a third of the price if they had waited, right? So again, companies do destroy a lot of value because uh, they tend to go into other countries and buy assets when things are are doing very well on that segment. They, they, they want to buy shiny assets, right? So managements are not us, investors. We like to buy things that no one wants, right? And sell when everyone wants that. Uh, management is kind of the opposite. They tend to buy uh, assets when that is an asset that everyone is looking for. Now, 
So if you look at the historical uh, figures of these companies, it's extremely difficult to figure out what's going on there. On top of this, they had this massive asbestos liability, which they had a subsidiary of an acquired company that in the 60s set, sold asbestos, right? Or a product with asbestos that they, they you know, they, they sold a, you know, many decades ago, but they were sued for the asbestos liability. And that company probably generated, let's say, $100 million on today's money in terms of operating profit. And they already paid $4 billion in penalties. I mean, a massive number, right? Now, what they did recently, again, just to, it makes the things even more complex, they spun off the bad company, the bad uh, uh, asbestos company, if you will, just like a shell with that liability there. It doesn't mean that they can get rid of this. No, that's not the point, but they can get rid of that impact in their PL. Mm -hmm. Right? Because again, they would have to uh, to now they will pay for that liability and they had done a lot of provisions. And if they had to pay more, they will have to do more provisions, but it not it will not flow to their PL anymore. Right? So imagine how messy, scary you read asbestos, spin-off, bad co I mean, it's it's just scary. Uh, but that's a company that's super undervalued, right? That's one example. And they have a certain level of debt too. And people get scared, what's gonna happen? Um, the, the nice thing about your approach is um, so many people from a behavioral standpoint can get wedded to a company or a stock. You know, um, once you buy something, it's so much easier to place a higher value on it. And same thing with the shorting side. I mean, I, I, on social media and Twitter, can't tell you how many people you see that just uh, all they do all day is look for confirming evidence. You know, they have a position. Shorts often are some of the worst. I, and I love my short seller listeners. But... Uh, <laughs> But for some reason, like you get it in your head once you're long or one. And it's the same thing identifying with any label, a sports team, politics, religion, whatever. Like your you, your brain just starts to malfunction a little bit. Um, and yours is it, you don't see that many people that are sort of willing to envelope or almost Bollinger Band a company to say, look, there's areas I like it. There's areas where I don't. And there's even areas where I'll short it. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Well, the the you know the name of the fund, you know, rational investment methodology, mm -hmm. is because of that, right? It's because of the. I have a on my presentation a, a picture. Actually, I, I found it weird to have a picture on a, a presentation of a methodology, but I do have one, which is the name of the tool that builds my portfolio is Odysseus, which mm -hmm. is Ulysses in Greek, and it's there, Uly Ulysses or Odysseus tied to the mast of his own uh, ship going through the Siren Island, right? And by the way, in, in the mythology, they, they actually had like birds, bodies, not like a fish, and then, but a woman's head. Um, and, and that's exactly what my portfolio rules do for me, right? Mm -hmm. Humans are awful in once they, you know, you found a fair value, you, do that, you did a lot of work on fundamental work uh, on a company. And it's like, look, I think it's worth that much. Now, the price falls, you start to second guess yourself immediately. Mm -hmm. Say, oh my gosh, what, you know, have I not seen something? What is the market seeing that I'm not seeing? Although you know that the market is just following short term uh, earnings or, or news. Um, so the, the way to, to contrapose this is to have rules to get in and out. And another thing is look into the same companies again and again and again. Because history will teach you exactly what you just said, right? You you know you get in love with that company, and then everything goes wrong, and say, well, I was not right, right? So I love to keep some companies uh, that I lost money with them. Those are the ones that I never give up in terms of analyzing the company, because I said, well, if I miss that, there is learning there. Otherwise, the confirmation bias only grows. Right. So if I lose money with co a company, whatever, for whatever reason, sometimes, again, is something super unexpected, could be even fraud. I, you know, I never lost money to, to, a, to a fraud because of the type of company that I look into. But maybe someone was 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 you know, committed a very uh, um, a hard to, to spot fraud uh, and you might lose money there. So this is bad luck. Um, 
But when I lose money is because I didn't see something on the fundamental side, right? Or, you know, I was not aware, or if I were, I didn't consider this a possibility, let's say a price war. Say, oh, I thought those guys would never engage in a price war, and guess what? They did. So, you know, it was, it is my, my mistake. So I think a way to avoid that is instead of going after uh, new ideas. And again, I'm talking about the type of methodology, type of approach that I do, right? I mean, this only works for certain type of companies, this type of investment that I do. I want to own a company for some years, short, even shorting for a few years. You now, I, I, I hope I can generate a lot of long-term gains for my clients versus short-term gains. I might not be able though, because some of my companies are rebounding so fast that if it hits my fair value, I'll sell. Uh, but the but the way to avoid this, in, in my opinion, is you know make sure that you look into the business for many years in a row, because then you're going to learn about your own biases. It's like, oh, I thought this company was going like you know to kill competition, and what? No, they didn't, because the other guys are good too. I mean, they 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 had their counter move. So, how how often are you uh, adding or subtracting names out of the universe? Is that pretty rare? Now it's it's literally like three, four a year. That's it, yeah. right? Yeah. Because the 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 a key part is how focused, repetitive my approach is, right? And because that's when I learn a lot. I mm -hmm. I the only way one guy can. Uh, be knowledgeable about like 60 companies. How, how do you do that? First, I don't have to write reports to anybody, so I don't spend time like the sales side does, right, doing this. Uh, so that's, of course, helps me a lot. But it's because I'm looking into the same company again and again and again. So I don't need to, to learn about their story. What, what are there any other resources you find particularly valuable? Um, I, and maybe you could I hear about how the... Uh, uh, software works is that automatically automatically like scraping the K's and Q's? Is it uh, manually inputting it? Is it uh, what? Yeah, it's a combination of a few things, right? The first thing is I have a template, right? So every single if we we in, we do another call and I show you my screen and you mm -hmm. see my valuations and. By the way, we can do this. I can do this with your listeners or whoever is interested in the methodology. I actually, that is my selling process, if you will. Mm -hmm. I always, I have an, an, an objective to make sure that I show some of those analyses to my, to my mm -hmm. clients. They need to see yeah. where I spend my time. So first, they look like the same. Right, and this I'm very methodical. If you look at my templates, uh, for instance, all my templates are now with a dark background. Rather research, it's better for your eyes. You can concentrate more. Wrote a macro in VBA, changed every single template to a dark format. Right, um, all my my monitors are 4K monitors for a reason. I need that. You know, it needs to be super sharp. Right, uh, so all that those details matter. So using technology, having a template, because a template makes me extremely productive. Now, the start of my work is uh, it's fundamental data from fact set, and and that's the only way I can do this because those databases, and of course I'm biased to say because I have been using them for years, um, it's 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 excellent. Uh, the 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 tool is excellent. You know, it's kind of like free advertising for them. I don't know if yeah. <laughs> I should be doing, but but it's just on the methodology. So you need to choose one provider uh, that is consistent. That that's my point, right? Yeah. So you need to find because if you go and download 10Ks in in different formats and try to build a model from scratch, oh, the amount of errors that you're going to input there. Is absurd. I mean, you will, you know, add depreciation, something like this. You will eventually do something uh, silly. Uh, so to avoid that, I download this data. But of course, I'm going to read the 10K, open the 10K. I have like one of my monitors here is sideways, you now huge, big, big monitor, so I can read my 10Ks and 10Qs. This, of course, and then I will change anything that I think is better for my understanding. All my fundamental, you know, how many trucks you have, how many miles, is done on a different, you know, on a different tab, where that's where I do all my detailed analysis, right? That is my inputs page. 
there because there I will arrive to a revenue line. That's the only thing that I need to feed my discounted dividend model. So I separate that because I don't want to have any sort of ad hoc, ad hoc analysis, uh, new formulas in the template itself. Because again, otherwise you're going to have a lot of errors there. So you need to be super, super methodical because otherwise your productivity goes away. Uh, you spend too much time with the model itself. And what I want to spend time is not with the model, but with the calibration of, of the assumptions. I want to read the industry reports, talk to my peers, talk to the company, right? If I, I see something on their 10K, and, and sometimes it's funny, you find, you find mistakes on 10Ks, uh, right? They just like copy and paste, and the number is wrong. It's like, oh, but this number doesn't match. It's like, oh yeah, and then you see it later uh, that number being, being being changed. Rare, but it does happen. Mm. Uh, so mm. doing your fundamental analysis, being super careful is extremely important because again, fundamental analysis is is the is the best approach, in my opinion, for this type of company, right? I mean, not the... Uh, yeah, no, I've seen it. It looks great. Uh, you've clearly put a lot of work into into that software. What's been uh, what's been the most memorable investment over your tenure? Anything come to mind? Good, bad, in between? Well, I, you know, I, I, I when people ask me about my investments, I always like to to say to say a few things that I did right. For instance, if you get a company like Tempur-Pedic, I am on my sixth. Uh, so I have been long or short six times the company mm. uh, and so far successful in all those positions so <laughs> four longs two shorts over the last 15 years and i find this fantastic because the story of that company have remained the same fourth ceo N they not, knock on wood where where does it stand now positive negative nothing it's what, no it's it's one of my most recent profitable uh, positions now and might yeah. be out of the portfolio soon. If the market keeps doing what it's yeah. doing, it, it's yeah. amazing, right? It's going to be, again, short-term gains, which is not my objective, but it might happen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But, you know, there there are things that I that I did wrong. And I said, like, look, if people ask you as an investor, have you screwed up on, on, on something? Of course, you have done, you know, uh, something. So the one recent uh, mistake I made was an investment on Carnival Cruise Lines, right? So I... I I, I compared the current crisis with the other prior crisis, the SARS and the H1N1, and did uh, you know simulated a recession, a virus impact. But, but just to give an idea, even with the H1N1, which was a widely spread virus, um, the the uh, the lowest quarter of occupation for Carnival was 98 percent. Mm in the middle of a huge recession in a, in a, in a virus spread. Now we are going to have multiple, right? Multiple quarters off here now, but that's when portfolio control is important. Yeah. The hit on my portfolio was around 3%. I have that you know, drawdown freeze. And even though my, my long short strategy is up for the year, it's all good. But again, the, it doesn't matter how much work you do how much you know about that company. And I have every single ship that they launched since 05, like modeled, I have the name of the ship, how much it costed, you know, the a plan for retirement of ships, everything is there. It's one of my best templates. And sometimes there is the unknown unknown, right? Yeah. The biggest pandemic in a hundred years. Yeah, that's gonna get you, but again, that's another another point is portfolio control. You need to to think about this too, because otherwise you fall in love with the company, you follow something going down, and then you lose a lot of money. That's not the objective. That's you should not be try to be heroic in any 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 investment that you do. Yeah, people the the, the cruise the the cruise um, customers they're like an entirely different species. I mean, there's people signing up again now. <laughs> that it is are ready it, to go on these ships uh, tomorrow. That's another important point, which is for every company it could be you know cruise lines, could be Weight Watchers, could be RVs, could be motorcycles. You name it. There's always a very particular type of person that likes that. So when you do on a per capita basis, who uses that company, it's always tiny. 
right? So you cannot say, so one of the worst type of analysis that you can do is to say, oh, this company only have a 2% penetration, so then they can grow like crazy. It's like, no, no, no. Maybe they have had a 2% penetration for 20 years. No, one of the, the, the first companies that I, that I an analyzed was during my hedge funds uh, days was Wrigley before they were bought by, by Mars, I guess. Uh, and if you look at gum consumption per capita in different countries, the delta is huge, massive, and it doesn't move. So, in other words, to assume that, oh, now Canadians are going to chew gums as Americans, doesn't matter, they're your neighbors, much lower levels of consumption of such a basic item, right? Mm. There's no price barrier, That's, it's just behavior. Um, so, the, the, for most companies that you see out there, the adoption ratio is extremely low. That's another reason why I focus on companies with a lot of history. Because that number is usually set for me, because it's impossible. Yeah. In other, so I, right, if I if I tell you here's a product called Coca Cola, try to model something. How many people will drink this? It's impossible. You have to observe history, penetration in different countries, and go from there. Yeah, I was I was smiling as you're talking about Wrigley because growing up, my grandmother was hugely popular with the children because she would put a dollar bill. Uh, she'd take the gum out, put a dollar bill in around the holidays, <laughs> and uh, would pass around to all the kids. Do you want a Do you want a slice of gum? And they'd come away with a dollar. Oh, awesome. um, and so, uh, and then on the occasion, would have the rare kid that'd be upset. They actually wanted the gum. <laughs> no, I don't want the gum. Yeah, you're kidding. Well, um, well. Anila, this has been a lot of fun. Where do people find out more if they want to follow you, your writings? Can they follow in the modelings if they want to get in touch with you and uh, chat chat markets? Where do they go? Yeah, no. So the best way to find me is on LinkedIn. Is if you if you Google my name there, Danilo Santiago and Rational, or even you just go on Google and Google my name, you're going to find some sort of presentation that's out there. Uh, you're going to find my email address there. Uh, they can contact me, uh, and I'll be glad to have a, a call with them. You know, using Skype, showing screens. That that's that's what I do. Awesome. It, you know, it needs to be very uh, focused on the fundamental analysis that I do. Uh, I want people to understand that because you know that's the core of my success or failure. I mean, that's for that matter. That's a very thoughtful offer, listeners. Uh, take that. Uh, take Daniel up on that. But be serious. Don't waste his time. As he mentioned, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and uh, you know we we may be working ten hour, twelve hour, twenty hour days again yeah. uh, here in a short order. Um, Daniel, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Matt Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com.